Today we come to the final part of our series, What is Church? For those who are visiting and wish to kind of catch up, it is online, all of the series. But last week we took a look at what is the mission, the driving force, the reason moving forward for church. And we really took a look at being and making disciples. That is the mission, that is the driving force of the church. Now, a lot of people in a lot of churches think, well, that doesn't have enough sizzle. We got to make it more exciting than that. But for Jesus and the apostles, that was it. Really, if you take a look at the core, the essence of the New Testament, it is about knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior, of being his follower or a disciple, and making disciples. Churches that lose that focus of being and making disciples, churches that lose that mission, die. They either die in numbers and close the doors, which we are seeing throughout the United States more and more, or even if the numbers are there, there's a death that happens spiritually, that it is a dry thing that people go to church Or even if it seems live, it has no roots. That is the mission, the driving force of the church, which is to be disciples and to make disciples. Now, if you've seen on the back wall, you also have a handout. And if you've been in the education hour, we have been taking a look at that whole spectrum of making, being and making disciples. So I'm going to walk through this briefly, and I want to let you know that it is a spectrum. There's no hard, fast, like all of a sudden you're one point and then the other. It could be that way. You might jump certain sections, but this, broadly speaking, is a spectrum of discipleship. Well, the first part is obviously non-believers, people who don't believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Christianity is not true for them. The second part is what I'm calling a cultural believer. A cultural believer says, I believe Christianity is kind of true, but other religions, eh, you know, might be true as well. Christianity just seems like maybe it's a good fit for me. And this, by the way, is what we have in huge numbers in America. We have cultural believers. But then there's this choice, because Jesus never said, hey, just be a cultural believer, did he? He said, follow me. But when people make a choice in our culture today, the default choice they make is to become a church-goer follower. So it goes something like this. I guess Christianity is true, and it's good to go to church. I do it because it seems right, and it's what my parents did. Going to church and maybe helping out is all that is asked of me, all that I really need to do. And we also have that in depth, in depth in the churches in America. I have a friend from seminary. His name is Pastor Scott Stroud. He's actually a pastor now in California. And yes, there are Lutheran pastors and churches in California, believe it or not. Not just Minnesota here or the upper Midwest. But Scott actually grew up here in Minnesota. And uh, I have permission to tell his story. He, uh, as he grew up, he made some really bad decisions. And one of those decisions ended up putting him in jail for four years. And while he was in jail, there was some Bible study, and and as he talks about it, the very last leg of his time in jail, there was a man named Pete. And Pete led a Bible study. And before, just before Scott uh, was let out of prison, Pete gave him his number and said, when you're out, give me a call. Well, Scott did get out, and he didn't give him a call right away. But he found out in the first couple weeks that uh, it was much more challenging on the outside than he had ever thought. And so he called Pete, and they met at a Perkins. And at the Perkins, Pete said this, 
Scott, you have two options in front of you. You can be a nice Christian, find a nice Christian church, settle down with a nice Christian woman, have a family of your own, and you probably have a wonderful, peaceful life and probably have eternity as your reward. Or you can become a disciple. And when Pete said that, Scott said his eyes just filled with tears because he knew in his heart of hearts that he wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to give his whole life to him. He didn't want to be just a Sunday morning Christian. And then Pete said this. He said, my wife and I want you to move in with us if you want to take that road that's less traveled. And so Scott moved in with him. You see, the choice, the choice isn't, Jesus didn't say, hey, I want you to become a churchgoer, a church follower here. He said, I want you to become my disciple. A disciple says Christianity is true, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that he is God himself who died for my sins, and I'm learning to follow him, to know him, to follow him, to obey his commands. That's a disciple. Scott said, I want that. Now, who was Pete in all of this? Pete was a disciple maker. A disciple maker says Christianity is vitally true. Because the gospel really is salvation unto all who believe. I share the gospel with others. But it's not just about evangelism. I walk alongside others in their faith, not only encouraging them, but I challenge them to learn and grow to be a disciple and to be a disciple maker. See, Pete, as a disciple maker, wasn't necessarily an evangelist, how we think of maybe a street preacher or something like that. Maybe he was, maybe he's done street preaching, I don't know. But what he did is he walked together with Scott to help him grow, to help him be a disciple. And ultimately, who is Scott now? He's a disciple maker because Christianity is vitally true. So today, we're going to take a look at being an ambassador for Christ because that is the heading under which all of this takes place an ambassador for Christ. And we are going to start out with the foundation, which is also the broadest part of being an ambassador for Christ. And it is this, it is this word, reconciliation. So going into our text today, starting with verse 18 and 19, all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That word reconciliation shows up four times in these two verses. It's actually a pretty rare word in all of Scripture. You don't find it a lot, but you find it here especially. And because it is so highlighted here, we have to understand what does reconciliation mean? Well, in a very broad sense, it means this, to have a relationship restored. Where there was once a whole relationship, there has now been a broken relationship, there is a gap in that particular relationship, and reconciliation brings these two parties back together. Sometimes it is clearing up a misunderstanding. Sometimes it is removing the offense that has created the broken relationship. Now you and I all know this intuitively. We know this because we either were children or we are adults with children. You have seen children fight over a toy, haven't you? And it is a big fight. 
And sometimes if you can't reconcile and have them to come to an understanding, which is to share the toy, you have to sometimes remove the offense. And what is the offense? The offense is generally the toy. And what ha- why is there that fight? Because on a childish level, it's because of selfishness and pride. I don't want to. It's mine. And I have to tell you, on an adult level, in many ways, it's the same thing. It is selfishness and pride. You know, if a couple gets married and the husband still is really close friends with an old girlfriend, really? Or the wife is close friends with an old boyfriend? And either, cup, either one says, I want you to stop that relationship. And you go, well, no. Selfish, selfishness and pride, isn't it? But it's even deeper than that, selfishness and pride. I mean, this causes a breaking of families. It causes a rupture in communities. It causes nations to war against each other. And if you start to really start to peel back all the layers, what you find is depravity. You find people who steal from each other, who lie, who cheat. But you also find people who hit, who punch, who stab, who murder, who rape, who torture. And in the face of that depravity, can there be reconciliation? I mean, this, this is the depravity of humanity. And if, if, if you doubt it, just read the news. If you doubt it, just look on Facebook. My goodness, all of the videos on there showing the depravity of humanity, it's, it's, you almost have to become numb to it to survive. And yet, it is this type of depravity that we have in our relationship with God. You see, that is our condition to God. What we have done and continue to do in our relationship to God is of that same depravity. Now, mostly we don't want to say that because we use a sliding scale. We look at other people and go, well, I'm not half as bad as they are, so, you know, I'm not depraved. Or we've taken this notion of, well, we got to love, the, hate the sin and love the sinner. But who's the one who's doing the sin? It's the sinner. That's the person who's actually giving the offense to God. And we don't like to even think about that because then we would have to say we ourselves are the offense to God. And that's an offensive statement, isn't it? And if we are to be reconciled with God, how can we remove what is offensive, which is us? We can't, can we? We can't remove ourselves and still have reconciliation. And therein lies the problem, doesn't it? For God is a holy God. And he can't be in the presence of that which is sinful. And yet God loves us, doesn't he? Each one of us. He loves us so fully. And he wants each one of us to be in that relationship with him. So how does he do that? Because we can't, can we? It's only God himself who can provide the reconciliation. And there's that word, the reconciliation. You see, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. See, it's God who does the action here, isn't it? And it is God who reconciles the word, not to us, but to himself. Because he is the one against whom the offense has been given. You know, you and I talk about carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders, don't we? Sometimes we feel like we're carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders. Well, God really did take the weight of the world, the weight of the sin and the depravity and everything of the world, and he put it 
on his son. And on his son and what his son did on the cross. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. It says, for our sake, he made him to be sin. Who knew no sin? So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's the foundation of being an ambassador for Christ. And really, it can all be summed up in this one word, propitiation. Propitiation is a big word. It's a theological word. Some people get scared of it. I got to tell you, it's such an important word that we tackled this last month with the youth. So if we can tackle it with the youth, we can certainly tackle it with the adults. Propitiation means to to appease the wrath of God. Christ dying for our sins appeased the wrath of God. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's how God reconciled the world to himself. Paul, in his letter to Ephesians, fleshes this out a little bit. This is from chapter 2. I'm going to read a couple verses. But now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, place of the two so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. This is the heart of the gospel message. This is the grounding, the foundation, the broadness, the reconciliation of what it means to be an ambassador for Christ. This is what God has done for us. Now, because what God has done for us, what are we to do? And I'm going to go back to verse 18 and 19. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. God gave Paul, and we believe that all believers, a ministry of reconciliation. Now, when you think of the word ministry, The idea that normally goes through the head uh, is often the office of ministry, like a, a, a pastor, maybe an evangelist. But ministry in and of itself, that word comes from the word diakonos, which simply means to serve. That's the basis. And by the way, that's also where we get the word deacon, servant. It means to serve. So here Paul is saying, I was given a ministry or a serving of this message of reconciliation. I was entrusted with this precious thing. And when Jesus entrusts you with something precious, he wants you to do something with it. I don't know if you remember, uh, in, from Palm Sunday, seems like ages ago now, Palm Sunday, Right before Jesus has a triumphal entry, there's a parable he gives about the master who goes away and he entrusts to his servants 10 minas. 10 servants, 10 minas. Mina was a large sum of money. He said, I want you to invest this, to do things with it. And when he came back, some of the servants actually had invested. They had taken that, what was trusted, and used it for the master's good. But there was one who said, no, I, I just, I, I wrapped it up in a handkerchief. I, I, I put it away. And Jesus said very harsh words for that man. Very harsh words. Some of us, all, actually all of us, all of us, 
We're given something very precious, which is the gospel message, which is the good news. We were given something very precious. And some of us kind of go, oh, let's wrap it up. Let's keep it to ourselves. What's it say in this little light of mine? Put it under a bushel. Okay, come on, let's do that again. Put it under a bushel. Put it under a bushel. This little light of mine, let it. That's right, let it shine. That's what we're supposed to do. We're take, take what is given that is precious to us and we are to let it shine. You see, Paul really believed the good news. He really believed that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and that he suffered, died, and rose again and that in him we too shall be resurrected to eternal glory with him. This is what grabbed Paul. This is what got a hold of him so much. Earlier in our reading, just a few verses beforehand, it says, the love of Christ controls me. Now this control isn't like this outward control. It's, it's more of what impels me, compels me, moves me forward. There's a fellow, uh, Pastor Andy Murray. He wrote this, Christians are not those who are merely are not those who merely agree to the facts about Jesus in their heads. Christians don't merely agree to the fact that Jesus died for them. Christians are those who are defined and controlled and constrained by Christ's love. The truth of Christ's love for us shapes us and grips our hearts and compels our lives. What compels your life? What gets you up in the morning? What would compel you to pray for people? What would compel you to not forsake assembling as a body? What would compel you to study God's word? What compels you? Is it the love of Christ? See, Paul understood what God did in Christ and he reconciled the world to himself. And he understood that he was given this ministry of reconciliation. And he says, because of all of that, because of all of that, therefore, I am an ambassador for Christ. Verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of of Christ be reconciled to God. Here, Paul uses this analogy of an ambassador. An ambassador is one who had great authority. Not because of the inherent authority, but because of the authority of the one who sent him. Look, if you were an ambassador of Rome, you had the full weight and authority of Caesar behind you. We are ambassadors for Christ. And do you remember last week? How much authority does Jesus have? All authority, right? We covered that quite a bit. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he says, in all authority of heaven and earth, go therefore and make disciples. Look, the authority Caesar has isn't even on the same scale with Christ. So, when we go out, when we are ambassadors for Christ, we do so because of the authority of the one who sent us and because we are compelled and impelled by his love, by the message of the good news. All right, so, for those who want to do some fill-in-the-blank work on the back sheet, back side of your handout, So who is an ambassador for Christ? The first thing is an ambassador for Christ represents the one who sends him. You know who you represent. People might say, well, an ambassador for Christ for Word of Life Church. Well, yes, but it's not the Word of Life Church that gives you the authority to to be an ambassador. It's Christ. So you got to know Jesus. Know Jesus as Lord and Savior. The second thing is, 
An ambassador needs to be in constant communication with the one who sends him. So this is through prayer, through reading of his word, through conversations, through listening. You're in conversation, in communication with God himself. An ambassador knows the message of the one who sends him or her. We have spent the last two years making sure we know what is the gospel? Can you actually explain the good news, the message of reconciliation? Most people in most churches can't do that at all. So we have been focusing on what is the message? An ambassador is a person of character. Now in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, which is just the chapter after our reading, Paul talks about purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, being of the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful in speech, the power of God. Look, if you swear like a sailor, you're not an ambassador for Christ. There's some character stuff that you got to work on. An ambassador is, well, all right, <laughs> an ambassador is ready. You don't know exactly when you're going to have an opportunity. And by the way, you should pray for opportunities. You should not just like being a jellyfish and hope something floats by that you can grab onto. Look for opportunities. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of salvation unto all who believe. But you're ready. Look, if somebody said, well, how come you're a Christian? Would you be able to explain it to them? Would you be able to even say anything or kind of go, I don't know, I, I guess, because seems to fit. That would be going back to that cultural Christian or a churchgoer follower. So an ambassador represents the one who sends him, is in constant communication, knows the message, is a person of character, and is ready. Okay, then, but what do you do? Okay, good, got that down. What do I do? Give me some hands-on stuff. Well, see, the, the trouble is most people think that ambassador for Christ means you've got to go door-to-door -door, uh, evangelism do street preaching or something like that. And look, that can certainly be part of it, but that's not all that it is because the goal here is to make disciples. It's just not about con uh, getting converts, although that's got to be part of it, right? Look, if people don't confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can't be a disciple no matter what. So you've got to be able to share the message. There's got to be the working of the Holy Spirit to transform their lives, to bring them to faith. And you've got to remember also, we talked about this, discipleship is not just a program that people go through. Oh yeah, come to our church, we've got a discipleship program. It's like seven weeks and then you're done. It's okay, not a big deal. Look, that's not discipleship either. Discipleship is living our lives so that we grow in the knowledge and love and image of Jesus. So an ambassador for Christ, broadly speaking, makes disciples. So there are a bunch of different activities that you can do as an ambassador for Christ. I'm going to give you six of them. They're not in any particular order, and it's not all-encompassing, but it gives you something to start with. So the first one is to share. To be able to share the good news. To be able to share how Christ, how God's been working in your lives. Do you remember in our education hour for so long and you probably got me so tired of me saying it? What's God been up to in your life in the last week? <laughs> Not the last 10 years ago, well God, no, the last week. What's God been up to in your life? Be able to share that. So it could be informally, you're, just, you're talking. It could be formally also going door to door, doing things intentionally, sharing. You pray. 
pray with people. Maybe it's just a stranger you met in the grocery store. And you start to talk, and it seems like, boy, they could use some prayer. Hey, do you mind if I pray with you? You'd be surprised how open and desirous people are of prayer. You know, when I worked in corporate America, there were so many opportunities. People came to me and in hard times and said, hey, could I pray for you? And they were like, yeah, I really need that. An ambassador studies with people. So there's Bible study. You know, so, Dean, if I just may mention that you and I, we've met this past year quite a bit. And often it's a highlight of my week because we just sit and study God's Word. And He makes me paraphrase everything. And sometimes it's hard. And I've got to really think. But I learn. And I grow as He grows. And that's joy. It's not this this dry, dusty study that we do. There's also small groups getting together and talking with other people about their walk in Christ, their walk in faith, and really sharing and just and opening up. That's the fellowship that, by the way, that we've been talking about in this series. That's fellowship. Being able to share with other people in that aspect. There's devotionals. Taking people to a movie, uh, you know, The Case for Christ, and then talking about it afterwards. That also can be part of study. There's worship. You know, having people come to church with you, inviting them, worshiping together. That's part of discipleship making. And then there's encouraging you know, helping people take the next step. Somebody says, oh, you know what? I just don't, I'm not a good reader. I, reading the Bible is really hard. I just had that conversation last week. And I said, oh, here. And I had my iPhone with me. And you know, on my iPhone, there's a Bible app that will read to you. And I said, you could do, and you can actually read along, have somebody, or you can just listen if you want. And it's free. Also on Google and other phones, you know? So you encourage them just to take whatever that next step is. And you can encourage people in person. You can encourage people online. I've, look, I've been discipling and helping out Suleiman in Kenya. Pastor John with, uh, in Pakistan, I, I sent him this whole sheet on discipleship. And he was like, this is great. Can I share it? I said, well, yeah, of course. That's part of discipleship and disciple making. And there's also accountability. I'm sorry, challenging people. What's next for you? Do you know why I'm a pastor? Do you know why I finally became a pastor? Because I was having a conversation with somebody And it was brought up that I had thought about being a pastor. And he looked at me, and I think I might have shared with you you already. But he looked at me and said, do you think you'd be a good pastor? I said, yeah, I think I would. And he said, well, you better get going. That's why I'm here today. One guy said, well, you better get going. With Pastor Scott in California. One guy said, you have a choice. You can either just be a nice Christian or you can become a disciple. These are all practical steps. If you want practical steps, so the question is this, are you willing to be an ambassador for Christ? Are you, are you personally willing? Not just like in general, but I'm speaking to each one of you. If I could look each one of you in the eyes right now, I would. Are you willing to be an ambassador for Christ? What's the next step for you? What action will you take and 
by when. So I'm going to leave a full minute of silence because I want you to think about this. One, are you willing? And then, what action are you willing to take and by when? And I want you to write something down. Oh, this, yeah, I'm doing that encouraging and that challenging if that hasn't come to forefront. So take a moment, and I'm serious, write it down. What step are you willing to take and by when? We'll take a moment of silence. Let's pray. Heavenly gracious Father, we thank you for the great love you have for us, given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, by whom and through whom we are reconciled. We ask that you send the Holy Spirit to embolden us, to guide us, to encourage us, to challenge us, to be ambassadors for Christ, all for the sake of your Son. And in his name we pray, amen.